We now want to turn our attention away from the United States briefly into the Horn of Africa, where we are in the twilight aftermath, I don't know exactly what to call it, maybe I'll ask my guests this exact question, of the war in northern Ethiopia, primarily there, but certainly the TPLF tried to take it other places. We are very honored to be joined as we continue the show by Ilya Samari, who is a contributing editor and host at the Horn of Africa TV, and also a veteran political activist in the, in the Eritrean struggle for liberation. Ilyas, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me, Eugene and Rania. Happy to be on the Freedom Side Live uh, with you. Great show. Well, we are really, really happy to have you here. And and maybe speaking to my my intro here, my first question is, you know, in some ways, of course, the way it's being presented in the mainstream media is like, okay, everything's over, nothing to see here, everything in Ethiopia happened, and obviously, like, the, the most intense phase of conflict has ended. But it does seem that there's a bit of an afterlife going on in terms of, you know, sanctions, demonization of countries in the region. I mean, it doesn't really feel like necessarily now is the time for people to to turn their attention away. And I wonder what you think about about where we are in the conflict? I mean, is it is it quote unquote over or is it just entering a, a different phase? Well, um, I guess there's grounds for uh, cautious optimism, uh, but still we are not completely out of the woods yet. Huh? The past two years have been horrendous, horrendous, a lot of destruction, uh, Close to a million people dead on all sides uh, from the from the war that was instigated by the TPLF, and finally the TPLF was, you know, forced to to sign the cessation of hostilities uh, agreement at Pretoria uh, in November of last year. That's about uh, two and a half months ago. So uh, there is. Uh, According to the agreement, the disarmament of the TPLF is slowly proceeding, though it's uh, much delayed than, than the stipulated uh, time schedule. But there is a beginning of disarmament. Uh, we see withdrawal of forces. Um, reports indicate that the Eritrean forces are, are withdrawing from northern Tigray to the international boundary line. Um, the restoration of services in Tigray, continuation of humanitarian assistance, all these are good signs. But knowing the TPLF uh, over 47 years of its existence, uh, there's a lot of grounds for, uh, shall we say, pessimism of the intellect. <laughs> to quote uh, Antonio Gramsci by way of Edward Said, there's a lot of grounds for pessimism of intellect, but we have to be optimists by, by, by the will. We need peace in the region. The Horn of Africa region has been ravaged by vicious conflicts, wars, uh, interstate, intrastate, civil wars, um, ethnic conflicts uh, for over seven if not eight decades. So this region of Africa, the Horn of Africa region, is in dire need of, uh, of peace. And that uh, peace, which was starting to blossom right in 2018, when the, you know, when the TPLF uh, regime collapsed uh, after massive uh, protests and uprising in Ethiopia, and a new reformist uh, government came in, uh, came to power, led by Prime Minister Abi Ahmed Ali. Uh, one of the th first things he did, uh, to his credit, his government did, was to recognize that the two decades long of conflict with Eritrea was uh, senseless. It was costing both countries uh, too much, and he made a breakthrough, uh, you know, visit to Asmara and agreed to, you know, abide by the Algiers Peace Agreement, the Boundary Commission's ruling. And so uh, soon after that, Somalia was also drawn into the, the peace agreement, the, the peace and cooperation of the three countries. So this was unprecedented. It was historical and the there was a lot of optimism on all sides. Uh, the people of Horn of Africa were finally 
beginning to breathe, uh, you know, the, the hopeful uh, air of peace. And, but the TPLF was uh, still not completely defeated and it wanted to gain back uh, what it lost in, in 2018, back to power. And so it unleashed the senseless war again uh, in, in November, early November of 2020. Uh, three phases of uh, reckless war that cost uh, too much in, in human lives and uh, in, in economic destruction. And finally, the Pretoria Agreement, uh, you know, uh, came about. The secession of basically the TPLF was militarily defeated, and thus it was forced to sign uh, the cessation of hostilities, uh, the peace treaty. So th- that's where we are right now. Yeah, I mean, and one thing that we see repeated over and over in media reports um, about this, I mean, today in the Washington Post, or yesterday in the Washington Post, there was an article about the peace deal in Ethiopia. And the last couple of months, it's the U.S. government has, and of course, all these various stenographers for the U.S. government at all these mainstream media outlets, they've almost stopped really attacking the Ethiopian government or blaming the Ethiopian government. It's all about Eritrea. It's all about Eritrean troops are the ones committing massacres. Eritrea has all of these, you know, it's really like like puppeteering all of the atrocities uh, in Ethiopia. It's almost like you would think it was Eritrea that was fight, that was fighting the TPLF in Ethiopia. My question for you is how do you respond to all those accusations? And what do you think is behind that very recent in the last few months pivot from attacking the government of Abiy Ahmed to making it all about Eritrea? A good question, a uh, good observation, Rania. Uh, I think uh, the, that the tactic now seems to be to resort back to, you know, to the default mode. When all else fails, blame Eritrea, uh, the scapegoating of Eritrea, which has been there since 1998. Uh, for decades, uh, the sanctions on Eritrea that were imposed at the UN Security Council, US engineered sanctions imposed on Eritrea in 2009 because Eritrea uh, refused to toe the line. It insisted that, uh, you know, Ethiopia under the TPLF should abide by the peace agreement, withdraw from occupied Eritrean territory. this the TPLF, uh, you know, refused to do. And, of course, the United States gave a blind eye to that. Uh, instead, it, it uh, punished Eritrea. And another development was that Ethiopia invaded in 2006 Somalia. Uh, at that time, Eritrea said this is uh, an unacceptable invasion of a sovereign nation. The only country in the in the region, by the way, to to stand against uh, the TPLF's aggression. So, for these reasons, Eritrea was constantly demonized. Sanctions were imposed on it on false charges that Eritrea was helping Al Shabaab. Completely uh, untrue, false, of course. Um, and this continued for 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 over almost ten years until in two thousand. 18, the TPLF regime collapsed. Then peace returned. When peace returned and Ethiopia and Eritrea were coming together, uh, resolving all their problems, and this peace expanded to include Somalia, this was, uh, I think, not to the liking of, of the United States. And they, they wanted to put a monkey wrench on this uh, to, to, to stifle this peace baby in its early infancy, if, if I may use that analogy. And, uh, you know, and to put a wedge again between Eritrea and Ethiopia. Uh, That's the only way that the empire can control the region, it it figures. I mean, uh, uh, it is obvious from from the moves uh, that we've we've seen the past two years that they don't like this organic peace, uh, what we call the new horn of Africa, emerging uh, and era of peace and cooperation whereby wars and vicious uh, cycle of conflicts will end. The countries would devote all their energy, all their resources to economic development and cooperate with each other. Uh, this 
obviously was not to the liking of the United States. And in this, they resorted back to demonizing and uh, isolating Eritrea. Um, and that's what we witness now. Uh, you see people like the former special U.S. envoy uh, Feldman, uh, Jeffrey Feldman, uh, wrote a, a piece at, <laughs> at foreign foreign affairs. You know Rania from from <laughs> the man's in Lebanon. Uh, yeah. in Lebanon. Uh, early on, I remember uh, when Feldman was appointed as the special envoy for the Horn of Africa. Somebody that you know, Asad Abu Khalil, huh? uh, Professor mm-hmm. Asad Abu Khalil, he said, "This is bad. <laughs> the man." Yes. Uh, track record in Lebanon, you know, sectarian conflicts. He, he's expert in that. Pitting one group against the other along religious sectarian lines. Mm-hmm. And that's what, what, what he was up to. He wanted to scuttle, I mean, he being representative of the deep state in, in Washington, of course, he was appointed by, by, by Secretary of State Blinken. So that was the mission, to, to scuttle the, the, the growing organic piece of the new Horn of Africa. And in two years, they, you know, they gave the TPLF all kinds of support. Uh, I mean, humanitarian intervention at, at points, you would see Samantha Power threatening, you know, uh, bringing uh, bogus charges like famine, non-existent famine mm-hmm. in Tigray. A genocide, uh, all kinds of horror stories. These were recycled and amplified by, by the media, of course, the, the mainstream corporate media of the West. So uh, this was what was happening in two years. Uh, finally, the TPLF, after three phases of, of attempts to, to reach Addis Ababa and to return back to power, to overthrow the, the government, uh, it failed and was completely defeated. Uh, and just when it was on the verge of total annihilation is when they stepped in through the, of course, the mediation efforts of African Union to to somehow rescue it and uh, give it a safe exit. You know, I was hoping so that, you that's could we have you touch on this a little bit, talk more about how strategic the Horn of Africa is. Because I think for a lot of people in the U.S. especially don't know a lot about the region and might be wondering, well, why is the idea of a new Horn of Africa where the countries are focused on development, improving people's lives? I mean, that all sounds very good, I think, to the average person. So why is it that this is something that the U.S. fears? Well, that's a vital, uh, the Red Sea Arena, what they call the Red Sea Arena, is a vital strategic waterway uh, whereby oil from the Gulf region, you know, uh, passes through, you know, uh, there is the Bab el Mendeb on the south, entrance to the Red Sea, and then it exits for, through Suez Canal, the Mediterranean, to Europe, okay? So millions of barrels of oil are, are uh, transported through this uh, vital strategic waterway. Uh, It's near to the oil producing Middle East. Uh, It's a bridge. The Horn of Africa is in a way an extension of the Middle East into Africa. Or Mm -hmm. you can say the Middle East is an extension of Africa into into, uh, West Asia. it's also a region that has the vital waterway, the Nile Basin. So if you look at the greater area, beginning from Egypt in the north, Sudan, South Sudan, Eritrea, Ethiopia, Djibouti, uh, Somalia, and then maybe Kenya and Uganda, this is could be considered as the greater Horn of Africa. It's of very, very... Uh, strategic importance and the U.S. doesn't want to lose control of this uh, this region, especially now at a time when, you know, in the global situation, uh, the unipolar hegemony of the United States is in decline and a new multipolar polar world order is emerging. Um, China is obviously on the rise. It's Belt and Road Initiative. The Horn of Africa is uh, a vital, uh, you know, uh, part of that Belt and Road Initiative. China, in fact, has now uh, the only base outside uh, in Djibouti. 
In Djibouti also, there are other military bases. The United States, Camp Lemonia is there. Uh, Germany, Japan, uh, Italy. I mean, a host of countries are there in that tiny city-state of Djibouti, right at the Bab el Mandeb, south of Eritrea. So, uh, for for these reasons, th- this uh, this region, the Horn of Africa region, uh, for the United States is vital. It, I mean, uh, it has been like that since the end of the Cold War, and it has been an arena of of contention with the Soviet Union during the Cold War. And after the Cold War, the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, the U.S. uh, hegemony uh, was there uh, all along. Uh, And for that, the TPLF was considered as a client state, as an anchor state to control the region as a proxy force. And so... uh, when the TPLF regime collapsed, I mean, it was overthrown by popular uprising in 2018. This was not to the liking of certain sectors of the deep state. You may call them the neocon, the war party, those who are now in uh, in the deep state in Washington, D.C., who came to power in uh, January 2020. The Biden administration, that is. And, and then so here I, I we are... Yes, no, that was a really good, no, 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 that was a really good answer. I just wanted to ask like something to sort of piggyback to sort of piggyback. 